subtrochanteric femoral fractures. This is from the OTA Resident Core Curriculum Lecture Series version 5. Slides are by Dr. Brandon Yuan. I'm Saket Brahman narrating, and in the first video we talked about anatomy, deforming forces, a little bit about classification. Um, so in this video we're going to talk about technique, and this is really... Um, I think kind of at the heart of uh, what you need to know, the take-home points of managing these injuries. So the majority of these cases can be treated with anterograde locked intramedullary nailing. Um, and we'll talk about the exceptions in the next video where we talk about some controversies. So here you can see a femoral subtrochanteric femoral fracture treated with a, a cephalomedullary nail, right? Anterograde locked. Um, so what about nails versus plates? Well, nails have greater load to failure, greater number of cycles to failure, higher force at failure. You know, plates are also an option uh, when uh, treating subtrochanteric femoral fractures. Again, you're not going to use a, a, just a sliding hip screw, for example, but uh, there are plates that can be used to fix uh, femoral uh, subtrochanteric femoral fractures also. Um, what about positioning? So a lot of the technique really is about um, how to make sure you don't get a malreduction. So you can do supine with a free leg um, positioning. The advantage is you have free control and access to the limb by the surgeon. You can maximally adduct the limb, which is a little harder with a traction table. Uh, it's a polytrauma patient. Being supine uh, is an advantage over being lateral, let's say, and to some extent being on a fracture table. Disadvantages are um, you probably need an additional scrubbed assistant. Um, it's more challenging uh, for open reduction if you're in the you know supine position. That is not so much being free, but if you're supine, uh, supine on a traction traction table has the ability um, to get some traction at least without an assistant. And again, it's still supine. Um, Disadvantages are uh, with the traction table, uh, nerve palsy, uh, well leg compartment syndrome if you use uh, a well leg holder. Here you can see more of a scissoring technique. Uh, and um, it can be more challenging when you have to do an open reduction. And uh, traction alone is not going to get your entire reduction. You're only going to get um, a certain degree of um, reduction from traction. So what about lateral position? So in the lateral position, um, you can have a, uh, the advantage is you can overcome abduction of the proximal fragment. Um, you can move the distal segment because the leg is free to match flexion. So let's say you have flexion to the proximal fragment. Well, you can just flex the whole limb in order to help with that reduction. The other thing is starting point can be much easier in the lateral position. And uh, also just open reduction in general. If you need to open up the, the uh, thigh to get to the fracture site, the tissues tend to fall away from you in the lateral position. Disadvantages are imaging can be a little bit unfamiliar or, or challenging. And then you really can't assess rotation. I mean, malrotation is a real problem with these fractures, and the contralateral leg is less accessible. I mean, you're not supine. You're not flat. You can't even get to the other leg. Um, uh, certainly difficult to palpate and assess rotation. So um, so those are some different ways. You can also do lateral position on a traction table, for example, which is not shown there. So, um, so you know, medullary technique is optimally paired with, you know, a closed functional reduction to maximize biology. Um, but you really don't want to have a malreduction. So although closed is nice, you should have a low threshold to do an open reduction because you really don't want varus. You want to have an acceptable sagittal plane and rotational reduction. So here you can see multiple techniques being used. There's a temporary plate there. There's a clamp. There are pins. There's a shans pin in the distal segment. So this one example, quite a few techniques being used. So what about using like a cerclage wire? Well, some people say, you know, they don't want to go in and strip all the bone and, you know, it's bad for fracture healing. I mean, 
generally speaking, subtrochanteric femur fractures are going to heal. Um, and a well-aligned fracture via open reduction, I think most would argue, is always preferable to a percutaneously done malreduction. You can see in this case, you know, they're always also worried about healing, and now they've put in a perhaps a uh, implantable bone stimulation device when, in fact, you know, the uh, fixation is probably not done adequately. So reduction can be done with, here you can see an intramedullary reduction aid. You can use so-called F-tool traction. These are things if you're trying to get a closed reduction. And then open reduction are traditional uh, clamps and picadors, cobs, elevators, hooks, shans, pins. These can all be utilized uh, if you want to, you know, start in a percutaneous manner and then continue to, you know, more reduction clamps. You can see Lohman clamp here. Collinear clamps can also be used. Depends on your fracture pattern and how you're trying to reduce it. Here you can see a very long fracture line. It looks like it would be really nicely reduced. You get near anatomic reduction with uh, a single Lohman clamp, what appears to be here. Um, and sometimes, like in that case we showed, you can use a surclage wire uh, to assist the reduction, and this can go, um, this can be kept in place. Uh, if you had to plate, you can certainly, uh, you know, plate over that. You can also use a temporary plate here. So the intention here is to do a nail, but they use a temporary plate to hold the reduction. That's over here. So kind of hinted at this earlier, but we'll talk about it again. Starting point is critical. Um, nail design really makes a difference. Uh, proximal locking is important. Um, so with sub subtrochanteric femur fractures, like we showed earlier, you certainly don't want to start too lateral. You don't want to aim medial. So here you can see they've started very medially, actually in the piriformis fossa, and you can see that they've aimed you know, fairly as lateral as possible to avoid varus malreduction. Blocking screw here as well. That's not in the subtrochanteric region, but you can see how they're trying to, to manage their alignment. So here you can see uh, error being, uh, you know, potentially, well, one of the errors you can have is to be too anterior and too lateral. So if you're using a trochanteric start nail, you want to start medial to the tip of the greater trochanter, as is shown here. Uh, so that will help to encourage valgus, right? You don't want to start out here. Um, so here you can see, oh, sorry. Um, so uh, if you're using a trochanteric start nail, you want to start central or even a little bit posterior to prevent flexion of the proximal fragment. So what you don't want to do is you don't want to come in this direction. Right, and if you are able to start a little bit more posterior and head in this direction, that will prevent flexion of the proximal fragment. Of course, you want to reduce this as well before you start instrumenting it. So this relatively anterior starting point, as I showed in the last slide, potentially is going to lead you in this direction and then lead to a malreduction. So you really want to be more like this. You know, if you're going to err, you're going to err in that direction. So if you're using a piriformis nail, you know, your starting point's in line with the intramedullary pathway in the distal segment. So you're already starting a little bit medial and posterior. So the advantage of the piriformis start point in line with the anatomic location of the femoral shaft, it's starting point medial and posterior. Um, there is a little bit of higher risk perhaps of malrotation. Uh, and if there's comminution here, that may prevent you from getting an ideal, you know, st ideal stability proximally. Trochanteric is a little easier to get to um, if the fracture goes up into the piriformis fossa, you know, it, it avoids that, uh, although you have to be careful not to go too anterior as shown previously. So if you, um, again, if you start laterally, and this is not starting too laterally, but it's certainly aiming very medially that can lead to varus, right? So, um, you can imagine when this is reduced, it's going to end up in varus. So you really want to sort of have that trajectory coming down the middle of the proximal fragment. And sometimes you'll need to place a blocking screw here to, to allow that to occur, right? So if there's medial comminution here, a lot of times when you put your reamer in or your guide wire, it's going to sort of go into the path of least resistance. 
And because you're entering, you know, the soft tissue envelopes here, you know, you're entering in this direction. Oh, we can't come in in this direction. So because you're entering the body from lateral to medial, there's a tendency to just head medially. So you have to fight that. And that's also made easier by being in a lateral position, for example, than supine on a fracture table. It's probably the most challenging position to get your trajectory right. Um, so uh, ensure that you have the proper path of the starting guide wire on both views. Uh, don't ream that proximal fragment. If it's flex and abducted, try to get a reduction as best possible. So in geriatric patients, you really do want to get fixation up into the femoral head. So make sure your nail for the subtrochanteric femur has options to lock into the femoral head. Okay. Uh, you can use a so-called recon or reconstruction nail, uh, which usually has a smaller proximal body, and modern nails have a lot of different proximal locking options, as shown here. You can use a cephalomedullary nail that are designed for intertrochanteric femur fractures, like the cephalomedullary nail shown here. Um, again, this is, this is something that can be used for a subtrochanteric femur fracture. So there's really no good data showing superiority, superiority of one nail over the other. Uh, but just keep in mind, recon nails usually come in a little bit smaller diameters. The proximal portion is a little bit smaller. Uh, if you're not trying to get lag fixation of the proximal femur, like you would with an intertrochanteric fracture, you probably don't need the lag screw. Um, so, all right, so that's a lot on technique. We're going to pause there, and uh, we'll pick up on... Um, controversies and then uh, wrap up in the uh, last video um, to complete this slide deck. Thank you.